Hey booktube, this is Friday Reads. I'm Jen and I talk about audiobooks and man did I read some fantastic books this past week. So I'm going to save the best for last and I'm going to start out with a book that I finished just today, just this morning, and that is Rookie Move by Serena Bowen. This is book one in the Brooklyn Bruiser series and it is narrated from two points of view by Nicole Zanzarella and Rock Engel. I had heard about this series and I was curious to give it a try because I'd read um, uh, one other book, I think, by Serena Bond and it was okay. It didn't, it didn't bowl me over or anything, but I, I liked it okay and I thought, oh good. Nicole Zanzarella and Rock Engel were good in that the performance was okay. I mean, like the mechanics of what they were doing was well done. I think they know what they're doing as narrators, but they were completely miscast for this book. They didn't capture any of the tone of the book, any of the feel of the book, any of the personality of the characters. And I say that because they narrated this, um, I don't know, they didn't get the Brooklyn aspect of it. This is a Brooklyn hockey team with people from Brooklyn. And the two main characters were high school sweethearts. So there's a history there. There is a six year gap from when they broke up until now and in the book. And I don't know, I, I just didn't think that they got it. Like I, the longer I listened, the more I thought this, no, this isn't working for me. And that was why. It really doesn't have anything to do with their um, ability or their competence as narrators, but it did have to do with them being matched up to the story and the characters. And it just didn't match up, not for me. So bad casting on that. And I got about mm, almost halfway through it and then I put it aside and I thought, I'm just gonna read this as an ebook. So I did. Finished it on my iPad this morning and I loved it. Once I got away from that narration, I loved it. I, because in my head, I could hear that Brooklyn accent, you know? And I, I really got the feel of, a, you know, it's like these guys, they're from Brooklyn, you know, and it's a hockey team. So they're, you know, they knock into each other and fight and, you know, it's a rough game. So you really got a sense of that. And not only that, but one of the characters, the main character is the publicist for the team and she is trying to prove herself. And so you got a sense of, you know, the fact that she's also from Brooklyn and she knows how to take care of herself. She knows her way around a hockey team. She was not intimidated to be around all these big rough guys at all. So I appreciated that. Um, I, that's the thing that made me up the rating on this book. I gave it four stars, really three and a half rounded up. But that was because I think Serena Bowen did an amazing job of capturing just the flavor of a Brooklyn hockey team. She just, she, I don't know how she did it, but she really did. Are you just, that atmosphere was right there. So I'm really looking forward to going on to the rest of the series. And in fact, I may pick up one of those books this week because I'm up in the air about what to read, but I'll tell you about that in a minute. Your One and Only is by Adrian Finley, and it is YA sci-fi about cloning. I got this book at the Tucson Book Festival. I bought it because I started talking to the author, and I, I just was so impressed by her. And as she talked about the book, she signed the book for me, I thought, initially I thought I wouldn't read it because it wasn't available on audio. And I asked her about that. She said, no, there are no plans to put it on audio. And I immediately thought, well, who can I talk to to <laughs> rectify that situation? But um, I went actually and bought the book and came back and had her sign it. That was how much faith I had that it was gonna be good. And it was, this is her debut novel. Again, YA sci-fi about cloning. And it really is all about how humans created clones in order to uh, keep the human race going, essentially. And those clones have formed communities uh, 300 years later, and yet there are problems happening, like transcription errors when it comes to cloning. You know, when you make copies of copies of copies of copies of copies, you're gonna lose a little bit along the way, and that's starting to happen. So they need new genetic material, so they get some from some archives and create a boy, and he gets introduced into the society, and it, the story becomes all about 
the rules that have been made by the clones and the rules of society and the way that they treat this human boy and the way they view him and you can see from both sides how well of course we're humans and so I was absolutely outraged at the way that they treated him but at the same time it was an interesting look at this society why they believe what they do how they function the way they do and why that uh, why they decided to make it that way you know it worked and it works for them but you introduce a human into the mix and everything changes so it's all about that I really liked it. I thought it was a very engaging story and my only problem with it is that I got to the end and I felt like the ending was kind of rushed. Um, and you get to where you want to be, so it is a satisfying ending, but there's a lot that could have been, in, uh, she could have gone into a lot more depth along the way had she taken the time to do that and um, I think the characters would have developed further had she done that. And you know, as with any books, you never know, maybe she did and then her editor cut it all out or I don't know. But anyway, I liked it. I liked it a lot and I will definitely read the next things that she writes. I asked her about that, what that would be and she said she had some ideas. Um, and she was, she had submitted those to the publisher but hadn't heard back yet so we'll see. I ended up giving it four stars. I really liked it. Most likely to score is book two in the Most Valuable Playboy a series by Lauren Blakely and it is narrated from two points of view by Andy and Zach. Andy Arndt and Zach Weber, my two favorite romance book narrators. I really, you know, these two, I am always happy when I see that they're the two narrating whatever it is that I'm listening to because I love them. They always get it right. They always capture the characters. It's always done so, so, so well. So, you know, I could go on for the next hour about why I like them, but I'll leave it at, you know, I like them. I like them a lot. And I say it all the time. This is a book about football. And interesting, I read a couple of books this week about uh, sports where one of the main characters was a publicist and the other was a player. And this was um, the case here. Um, the thing I liked about this was that the publicist is a woman who was adopted at birth by an American couple. She is Chinese. And so you have that bit of diversity in there. I really, really appreciated that. Um, she's definitely a California girl, but there was that heritage there that she acknowledged and, um, you know, it was just part of who she was. I really liked that. Um, cute story, you know basic romance, uh, got a little racy in spots, so I just kind of skipped ahead, you know, whatever. I really liked it. I think that Lauren Blakely has a good thing going with this series, and I ended up giving that one four stars. The Girl Who Drank the Moon is by Kelly Barnhill. It won the Newbery Medal, and it is a middle grade fairy tale. It was delightful. It's narrated on audio by Christina Moore, and I probably could go on for the next day about how fantastic Christina Moore was. She was the absolute perfect narrator for the story. Uh, there were so many voices. There was a swamp monster. There was the witch. There was the bad witch. There was the dragon, the enormous dragon who actually could fit in your pocket. There was Luna, the main character who as a baby is rescued by the good witch. And um, just all of these, all of these voices that she just made so distinct and so delightful. Oh my gosh. It is a pretty involved fairy tale with regard to magic and a lot of miscommunication going on, which is always um, kind of frustrating in some books, but not in this one at all. Not in this one. Um, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I can highly recommend it. If you like a pretty involved fairy tale about these sorts of things with just quirky characters, um, very innocent childlike characters, um, 
kind of, this book is kind of like watching Sesame Street for new parents, you know, because the people who do Sesame Street uh, throw in a lot of like little jokes for adults that kids don't get. They go right over kids' heads, but the whole thing is for kids. So this book kind of did a little bit of that. It was I just very enjoyable. I picked it up because my friend Lisa is reading a lot of middle grade books for middle grade March and she wanted a copy of this book. And so I bought it because Kelly Barnhill was at a book festival and she signed my book. So I didn't read this book. I did listen to it on audio, but now I'm really glad that I own this book. So five stars. It was amazing. Speaking of amazing, Oh my gosh, the most amazing book that I read last week was Endurance, A Year in Space, A Lifetime of Discovery by Scott Kelly and Margaret Lazarus Dean. This is narrated on audio by the author and I had the absolute privilege of meeting him, listening to him speak at this book festival. He did sign my book. I wasn't gonna buy this book, but I, you know, I, decided kind of at the last minute that I would because I thought he's an astronaut. Oh my gosh. Has a cool rendering of the International Space Station in it. This guy is so fascinating. First of all, it was incredible to hear him tell his own story. And when I met him to have him sign this book, I told him he was a pretty decent narrator and I'm a pretty good judge because, you know, I listen to all kinds of audiobooks constantly. And he is, you know, Mr. No-Nonsense Scientist. So he just goes, oh, okay. <laughs> it's kind of cute. His fiance was sitting there and she is devastatingly gorgeous and really smart. She works for NASA. And so just meeting them was amazing. Well, the book is the story of this guy who was a kid who could not pay attention in class, who was kind of a ne'er-do-well, got to college and was flailing and happened to pick up the book, The Right Stuff, which is all about the early space program and astronauts um, in the early days of NASA and changed his life. He became a Navy pilot and then an astronaut. He went to space for a year, a year. I was, uh, you know, first of all, I was astounded by his life, all the things about his life that led him to the point where he did go to space. And then he hasn't just been there once, he's been there three or four times. But the thing about space is that you risk your life every time you get in any kind of a ship that takes you to the International Space Station. Once you're there, oh my goodness, you are risking your life while you're there every day. Anything can go wrong. When they went out to do spacewalks um, outside the ship, um, they would take a day to get ready because they'd have to go out, they'd have to fix things. And he talks about little things like the gloves that they wear that protect their hands are so awkward because you can't really do very much with them. Like you can't manipulate your hands very effectively in order to do repairs. And so it takes a long time. Uh, they do a lot of redundant testing, things like is it okay? Let's look again. Let's check again. Let's check again. They do a lot of that because your life is at risk. There's no running water in space. I think that would drive me crazy. A year without taking a shower? And basically all they do is use wet wipes because you don't have water that can be contained in space unless it's in like a plastic bag or something. Everything floats. So liquids float. So you don't want liquids to get away from you. And stuff, I guess they find stuff all the time, all over the space station that people have lost. It's floated away and they've lost track of it. And then it'll, you know, be wedged behind something in an air vent or something like that. They're constantly fixing everything. And uh, he had a lot of things that he had to do, um, things he hated having to fix. They are constantly on camera talking to NASA and uh, Houston and primary schools with school children, talking to them about that. Um, you know, talking to all kinds of groups, um, doing kind of a live thing with them. Um, and of course, always NASA, always NASA is in their ear. It was interesting to see sometimes they would get off away from the camera and he would talk about how, you know, then he could react. Then he could say, tag on it, or, well, the language was <laughs> far more colorful than that. You know, times when he was really frustrated by something that had gone wrong or some change that had to happen. There were three, three 
different supply ships bringing things to the International Space Station that something went wrong and they couldn't get there. One of them started spinning and they couldn't recover the, like the direction. They couldn't get it straightened out and so it crashed. The other one blew up on the way up. Um, I forget what happened to the third one. So it is very much of an international cooperative effort once they get up there. Like the Russians all have their area and the Americans have their area and I think there are a couple of other areas. And so, oh my goodness, all kinds of people up there. And Scott Kelly went up for a year, but he'd also been there for another shorter time and went up to repair the Hubble. So really, really fascinating stuff. I, it really struck me when he said that when you're outside on a spacewalk and you become untethered from, you know, the ship, there's nothing there to pull you back. Uh, you can be an inch, an inch away from grabbing onto something. And if you can't, you're dead. You're just dead. So many times, if something didn't happen, you're dead. You're dead. Oh my gosh. Just the, the way that these people risk their lives. And also, they're guinea pigs. I mean, a lot of the experiments that they're doing involve taking blood samples and other kinds of samples and, you know, examining the way uh, you change, your body changes without gravity. What happened to him when he came back from space and how gravity really, really slam dunked him and began to, you know, change his body. He grew a little taller when he was in space and then he lost that little bit of, of height when he came back. It was really, oh my gosh, all of the stuff. I was so fascinated, just so fascinated. He was um, so interesting to listen to. It was amazing. So five stars. And if you get a chance to read this, um, you should. If you like science, if you like space, if you like a great human interest story about achieving something that you didn't think you could do, this is an excellent book. So yeah, I really enjoyed that. That was last week. This week I am debating. I thought about picking up Pacifica. This is by Kristen Simmons and I have this on audio. It is narrated by Solina so Sonila Nankani. Forgive me, Sonila Nankani, and um, love this book. She signed it. This is her newest book. It's all about pirates. It is set in um, a post-apocalyptic U.S., and the main characters are the daughter of a pirate and also the daughter or the son of, uh, like, the president. The thing about this story is that she based this story on her grandmother's experiences as a Japanese American who was in an internment camp. Really, really interesting. There's an entire prologue that Kristen Simmons narrates about her great grandmother's experience. And it is fascinating to hear how she survived this amazing thing. And then how Kristen Simmons has taken that experience and turned it into a fictional story that kind of pull those same values and um, ideas. And I'm really pretty anxious to get to this. So I may do that this week. Um, I'm not sure. I have uh, also this one, The Way I Used to Be. This is by Amber Smith. Also had this signed when I went to the book festival. And it's narrated by Rebecca Ross. I am not a huge fan of Rebecca Ross, but for this story, I've started listening to it and it's okay. It's not bad. Um, I started it on the plane, and then I was kind of flipping between that and um, Endurance by Scott Kelly. So this is a story about a young girl who gets raped, and that happens at the very beginning, and I'm not sure what where it's going to go from there. Um, it does, uh, it, well, it says it's told in four parts, her freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior years, and so... That'll be interesting to see how, as she grows up and gets older, how she views this experience and what happens. So I also have uh, three or four books in my Audible Romance package that are just sitting there waiting for me. So I really need to get to those too, because you know it's like a library book. You, you get it for a certain amount of time, but then it goes away. And so you have to go back and get it again. So I wanna do that. So that was last week and this coming week, Lots of options, lots of amazing books last week. I actually, these two 
were, oh my gosh, just what a week. Between these two books, I think, you know, if I could have a week like that every year, man, I would never stop reading at all, ever, <laughs> ever. So anyway, if you've read any of these books, of course, I want to know what you thought of it and let me know how your weekend is going. And that is it for now for me. I will see you next time. Thanks so much for watching. Mm -hmm.